It's Wednesday, February 1st. One's coming to negotiate. The other says, what is there to negotiate? We start here. For the first time as Speaker, Kevin McCarthy goes to the White House to talk about the debt ceiling. Basically, do this or this is on you. What could they possibly say to each other that will avoid a calamity? Forget rhetorical bridges. President Biden's interested in literal bridges. These are jobs where you don't need a college education. You don't need to go into debt. As his infrastructure plan becomes a reality, what happens to the economy? And while the U.S. decries executions in Iran, our ally Saudi Arabia has been killing more citizens than ever. That's over a thousand people killed in the last eight years. The growing comfort of Mohammed bin Salman is making world leaders uncomfortable. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. Officially, we've blown past our national spending limit. Congress has approved budgets and laws that require money, but hasn't borrowed the money it needs to pay for them. We hit that limit a couple weeks back, setting the stage for a monumental default on American debt for the first time in history. The reason that hasn't happened yet is because, officially, the government is doing some accounting magic to borrow from other programs within our coffers, which is why, officially, we still have some precious time remaining. I I would think if you listen to the president in the past, He always thought people should sit down and negotiate, especially on the debt ceiling. Well, today, for the first time since being elected House Speaker, Republican Kevin McCarthy will head to the White House to meet with President Biden. And the very notion that we would default on the safest, most respected debt in the world is mind-boggling. He's hoping to negotiate a deal in which he will approve raising that credit limit. However... The president says he doesn't plan to negotiate on this at all. Let's start today with ABC's senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott. That's right, senior. She got a promotion. Rachel, I'm still basically a freshman, so will you explain to me what we're about to see today? Well, Brad, in just a few hours, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy will be meeting with the president at the White House. And look, quite frankly, this is going to be just a little awkward here because McCarthy wants to have this negotiation over raising the debt limit. He has conditions. We have a critical point where we are, $31 trillion of debt. He says if Republicans commit to raising the debt limit, then he wants the president to commit to spending cuts. But the president says that he doesn't even want to talk about this. There is no negotiating around this. I'm not going to get into the reckless threats and take the economy hostage in order to force an agenda that's going to only limit American workers and weaken us internationally. I won't let that happen. And you really have to think about this like maxing out the nation's credit. So if Congress does not raise the balance, then the government defaults. And none of this is focused on future spending. This is about paying for the bills that we sort of already have. But time is sort of running out here because if Congress does not act by June, this could get really bad. Troops could go unpaid. Social Security payments could stop for seniors. And then we could see interest rates spike on everything from mortgage to car to credit card payments. Right. Like when the nation's credit gets downgraded, that can affect literally everyone who's trying to do business in the country. So I get that Biden thinks the debt ceiling is too important to negotiate over. Like, I I get why he thinks that. And yet, if it's so important, wouldn't that mean that if push comes to shove, you would negotiate to raise this very important thing? Like, it has to get done. I guess I'm wondering, is this a feasible political strategy just for the president to be like, nope, come back to us when you fully decided to cave, Mr. Speaker? Yeah, the president's message to Republicans is basically do this or this is on you. What in God's name would the Americans give up the progress we've made for the chaos they're suggesting? I don't get it. And I'm told the president is expected to pose two questions to McCarthy, really confronting him and challenging him on committing to avoiding catastrophic default and then also releasing sort of a detailed, specific, comprehensive budget, which we haven't seen Republicans do quite yet. But the strategy here by the White House is get Republicans to cave on this issue. And beyond that, they're actually threatening to have us default on the American debt, a debt that's been accumulated over 230 years, okay? And the president does have a point. I mean, this is something that Democrats and Republicans have largely worked together to do over the last 80 years. But this time we are seeing this really bitter standoff, Brad. Hey, we're talking about the Republican caucus maybe keeping discipline within their ranks if they're trying to drive this home. Can we talk about discipline with Congressman George Santos from New York? Congressman, when are you going to hold that press conference? Soon. Any guidance on that? You've said soon for the past week or so. Soon. 
that's an answer, isn't it? Like, at this point, he's admitted to lying or embellishing huge parts of his biography, and yet he was supposed to be on a couple of committees, but now it sounds like, what, he's done. Oh, Brad. So, yes, this is Congressman <laughs> George Santos. I mean, he is accused of fabricating literally almost every detail of his life. I mean, he said that he worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup. He didn't. He claimed that his grandparents survived the Holocaust. That wasn't true. He even said that his mom was in the World Trade Center on 9-11, but records that we have show that she wasn't even in the U.S. at the time. He told voters that he graduated from Baruch College at the top of his class, that he had a volleyball scholarship. I mean, that was a lie as well. He never graduated from any college. Are you considering, oh, so are you considering resigning? No, I'm not. And Brad, he has been defiant. He's facing calls to resign. We have literally chased him through the halls of the Capitol. Pardon me, guys. Pardon me, guys. Asking questions about his background and his resume, he is refusing to resign, but he did make one key concession. He says that he will now recuse himself from any committee assignments. So this essentially means that he's stepping down from serving on committees, but he still will be able to vote on legislation. And I can tell you that's a vote that can Kevin McCarthy really needs with this razor thin majority. But I'm wondering, Rachel, was this his decision or was this McCarthy's decision being like, hey, buddy, you can't be like, you look terrible for us. You need to step down from these committees. Well, this announcement did come after the two met behind closed doors. Did, did McCarthy tell you to, to step I'm away sorry. from the committees? Or Nobody did tells me to do anything. I made a decision on my own that I thought best represented the interests of the vote. And McCarthy says this is only temporary. He says once and if everything gets cleared up with these multiple investigations, then Santos could come back to those committees. Yeah, although whether or not McCarthy asked Santos to step down, you kind of got to think that Santos is now like at the mercy of Republican leadership. Like if he doesn't vote yes on their bills, if he doesn't help them navigate that slim majority, they're theoretically the only folks protecting him from that vote that would kick him out of Congress. Rachel Scott there at the Capitol. Thanks a lot. You bet, Brad. Next up on Start Here, if you build it, they will come. At least they better if we're paying a trillion dollars for it all. We're back in a bit. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. 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 That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the Table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Cut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. I love the true crime community because I can make a difference. Police found a skull in a bucket of cement. We're at a dead end. So law enforcement turned to the public. I was obsessed. This was one that I had to solve. I got a phone call of you sitting down. This is why I take blood pressure medicine. Holy crap. My motto is go big or go home. Web of Death. Now streaming only on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. Yeah. 
Let's talk about some politicking now that will affect you even more immediately. Yesterday, President Biden showed up to a rail yard in New York to hype up a new tunnel that's going to be built. This is just the beginning. It's the beginning of finally constructing a 21st century rail system that's long, long overdue in this country. The previous day in Baltimore, he arrived at another train tunnel, one that currently exists, that's getting a facelift. And he'll be the first one to tell you, President Biden loves trains. I've been riding an Amtrak for almost as long as he's been an Amtrak. But ordinarily, you might think these appearances are, I don't know, not worth his time? Like, it seems so local. That's what's distinct, though, about these appearances. He's not touting one particular project. Instead, ahead of next week's State of the Union address, he's touting what are about to become an exploding number of projects across the country. ABC senior national correspondent Terry Moran is here. Terry, if it was Infrastructure Week leading up to the, all this legislation that made this possible, is this Infrastructure Year now? All this all this money's finally about to get spent? It is. Finally. Uh, I think the message that Biden wants to send is things are finally happening with all the money that was passed way back. You might remember the bipartisan infrastructure law passed in November 2021. That's a $1.2 trillion bill, a huge investment. Uh, And these uh, three projects that he's highlighting this week, the one in Baltimore, a 150-year-old decrepit tunnel that's been a bottleneck up and down the East Coast for freight and passenger rail traffic, the new tunnel under the the Hudson, which is so important to the the nation's largest uh, metropolitan area. Uh, And in Philly, he's going to be talking about replacing lead pipes, getting clean water, not just to the people there, but to people in cities across the country is just some of the 7,000 projects they're going to be rolling out in the next several months because of that infrastructure bill. Americans see these projects popping up across the country and it sends an important message that we're going to, when we work together, like we did in the bipartisan law and the CHIPS law, there's nothing we can't do. And I think he's also trying to set the table for the State of Union in, in a different way, which is that yeah, there was this era in American politics, right, with, with, with Trump, where it seemed the presidency was basically a theater of spectacularly entertaining and terrifying daily dramas, mm. right? This is old-fashioned presidency making, right? This is, I'm, I'm cutting the ribbons on some tunnels. There's a lot more coming. Like it's, not, it's not just beefing. Right, yeah. It is essentially, he's, he wants to give people the impression that the government's working in a normal way. After a long time where it seemed like things were abnormal. But, Terry, I feel like it's easy to go, yeah, big whoop, you shaving maybe 20 minutes off of somebody's commute into Washington, D.C., or maybe shaving half an hour off of their train ride into Penn Station. Does this, though, affect, like, the larger economy? What is this kind of new economy under, under President Biden? What could that look like? That's a great point, and that, and that is something very real. With the determination of the U.S. to have more semiconductors and more chips being produced in the U.S. You know, all the masters of the universe were meeting in Davos uh, last week, right? All the economists, world leaders, uh, business people, and they were all talking about what the United States is doing, not just with the infrastructure bill, and it's not just commuters. There's a lot of freight rail traffic uh, that that is happening, too. But it's, remember that green energy bill, $370 billion passed as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Semiconductor Chips Act, that is another almost $300 billion to jumpstart that industry of the future. What Biden claims he's doing, what the people in Davos were saying, hey, it looks like America's actually gotten stolen a march on us, they've gotten ahead of us, is trying to set the table, reboot the American economy for the next few decades. And people are noticing. One of the things about the infrastructure law that I'm most excited about is we're doing all of this with all American workers. For example, that repaired bridge in Baltimore, uh, which was such a bottleneck, That'll be up to 20,000 new construction jobs. And everywhere Biden goes, the White House and he point out, these are jobs where you don't need a college education. You don't need to go into debt. He's trying to get the, the job base shifting back towards middle class people, towards people who don't go to college. We risk losing the edge as a nation. And China and the rest of the world are catching up for decades. The backbone of America has been the middle class. And it's been hollowed out. All of that, he believes, will reboot the American economy for the 21st century. Now, Republicans say, wait a minute. What you're looking at is trillions of dollars in spending, government spending, and that means inflation. It's the government working together to solve a major problem at a time when the country needs to see examples like this of coming together and getting an outcome. This has been the bet that Biden made with his presidency. 
that if you do pragmatic things in a normal way, the country will calm down. And I think the midterms for him confirmed that. You know, all the conspiracy theories, they're going to steal this, they're going to steal all the, all the crazy culture war stuff. People just may be tired of that, and they want to get things done again. And it's one thing to see, like, the shovels come out on the big photo op. It's another to actually see that thing built on time, on budget, whatever it takes. So we'll see how different cities sort of respond to these projects as they spring up. Now, Tara Moran, thanks a lot. Thanks, Brad. There have been some interesting developments in the Middle East over the last 24 hours. In Israel, Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited with Israeli officials. He also met with Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas. In Iran, a couple was sentenced to 10 years in prison for posting a video of them dancing in public. Meanwhile, it appears Iranian and Russian leaders have agreed to link their banking systems to help support each other through sanctions, which creates not an Eastern bloc like in the Cold War, but what kind of an authoritarian bloc of countries. But if the U.S. is sanctioned those authoritarian countries, it's worth noting that yesterday a new report came out claiming that in Saudi Arabia, remember, a U.S. ally, its authoritarian leader is executing more and more of his own citizens. ABC's Guy Davies has been reporting this out. Guy, I've never thought of like, Riyadh as having a particularly forgiving criminal justice system, but so what's so noticeable about the numbers here? I think it's the stark increase in the use of the death penalty since 2015, since Mohammed bin Salman and his father, King Salman, came to power. Uh, six of the bloodiest years of executions in Saudi Arabia's recent history have taken place since 2015. Uh, the use of the death penalty has almost doubled annually. What this report shows in quite granular detail is that The number of annual executions has risen from about 70 in the years preceding his leadership to almost 130 annually. That's over a thousand people killed in the last eight years. The preferred method of execution is what's known locally as crucifixion. That's different to how how we would understand it. It's a public beheading. But this takes place after extremely secretive trials. Uh, There are a number of cases in this report of families of those who are on death row being even unaware that their loved one was facing the death penalty, let alone when they were killed. Mm. Um, And what organisations like Reprieve, who co-authored the report, and the UN have said is that they're using this to clamp down on critics of the government, that a lot of the, these cases are where people are charged on on inciting violence or on terrorism charges, but that's got an extremely broad definition. Look, you got a family that is worth $100 billion, which crushes democracy, which treats women as third-class citizens, which murders and imprisons its opponents. And I just don't believe that we should be uh, maintaining... a a warm relationship with a dictatorship uh, like that. So there's this contrast between the outward projection of modernization in the kingdom, relaxing the ban on women's driving, for instance, encouraging tourism, increasingly getting involved in the world of sport, and what MBS is doing domestically, which human rights groups say amounts to stamping out dissent. And... Guy, like, to be clear, this is not the highest rate of execution, even though we've seen this dramatic increase. It's not the highest rate in the world, right? Like, China is estimated to execute thousands of people in a year. But it sounds like what you're saying is this is really about kind of the evolving style of Mohammed bin Salman, of MBS. Yeah, I think the authors of the report would point to this hypocrisy, Mm -hmm. uh, projecting Saudi Arabia as a modernizing country, maybe looking at some of the success of the other Gulf states, all the while ruthlessly stamping out opposition internally. And and the background to that is Saudi Arabia has been a major Western ally. And we've seen their human rights record be overlooked because of this supposed geostrategic importance. Uh, lots of analysts would say that was the case with Jamal Khashoggi, that, you know, Saudi Arabia is too important an ally to lose. Mm. But what reports like this do is put pressure on the corridors of power in Washington to really hold Saudi Arabia to account. Yeah, yeah. From a U.S. perspective, Guy, I mean, does this change how the U.S. deals with it? It feels like once Jamal Khashoggi's killing didn't really alter our relationship, that that was kind of the end of the story, or is it? Well, last year, on March 12th, uh, Saudi Arabia carried out 81 executions in a single day. It was the single bloodiest day in their history. Uh, And Joe Biden went to Saudi Arabia later on that summer. I know it's late, but thank you for being here. To 
discuss energy. We had a good d discussion on ensuring global energy security and adequate oil supplies to support global economic growth. We've had testimony from the, the families of some of those people who have been put to death in Saudi Arabia saying they're worried that every single visit, every summit Saudi Arabia goes to, that the West are somehow legitimizing uh, the regime and their methods. But at the same time, uh, amidst all of this, uh, Saudi Arabia has proven itself to be a fairly unreliable ally. We've seen the kingdom go its way, own way in a number of uh, geopolitical and diplomatic disputes. Mm. Um, with the current war in Ukraine, uh, Crown Prince MBS, it's not like he's come really firmly down on NATO's side of things. He's been talking to both sides. Uh, leveraging the kingdom's uh, diplomatic way in ways that don't necessarily reflect Washington's interests. While this report is significant uh, and it goes into this incredible amount of detail, we can't necessarily expect it to change uh, the fundamentals when it comes to the relationship between Saudi Arabia and the West. But that is interesting that you say that the kind of supposed value of Saudi Arabia might not always be as kind of cemented as we think. All right, that's Guy Davies reporting on this. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, they like her. They really like her. In fact, no one was ready for how much they liked her. One last thing is next. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is abc news live america's number one streaming news free to you 24 7 watch america's number one news whenever you want it wherever you are anytime abc news live streaming live and free on all platforms bring them on if only there was a place in the morning to start my day with a smile Somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the Dorms, now streaming only on Hulu. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from Pensacola, Florida, I am Will Reeve. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And one last thing. Oscar nominations have been out for more than a week now, but it was only yesterday that one category actually got nailed down. That's because for days there's been an investigation by the Academy itself, seemingly sparked by one underdog nomination for Best Actress. Andrea Riseborough in To Leslie. When Andrea Riseborough received her first ever Oscar nom, people were shocked. Not because her film To Leslie wasn't good. Most people who saw it seemed to like it. It's got a 97% rating from critics on Rotten Tomatoes. You do The issue was more that, well, no one had seen it. It grossed $28,000 at the box office. How could a film that under the radar get the votes it needed? 
Well, first of all, remember that for nominations, it's not like everyone in the Academy gets a vote. Best Director nominees get selected by directors, Best Acting categories get selected by actors, and so on. There are about 1,300 actors on this list, so if a good chunk of them are on your side, it doesn't matter how many tickets your movie sold. But that's what the Academy was trying to figure out. There are rules to campaigning for an Oscar. You can't bribe someone, for example, but if there's one thing this indie movie did not have at its disposal, it's money. What do you plan to do with 190,000 smackaroos? I don't know, maybe buy a house, buy something nice for my boy, you know? Just have a better life! What this appeared to be was the old-fashioned concept of doing a well-liked actress a favor. Several A-list actors, from Gwyneth Paltrow to Kate Winslet to Charlize Theron to Edward Norton to Mia Farrow, a ton of them, all simultaneously began gushing about this film. I can't stop thinking about it. It's the kind of movie that stays in your mind. It stays in your bones. It even stays in your skin. Some of them used almost identical wording in their social media posts about a small film with a giant heart. So was there maybe some suggested wording sent along to them? Perhaps. Did it help that the film's director is a popular TV producer who got a lot of these people roles throughout the years? Maybe, but that's not super unusual. The step that might have been a rule violation here was that one of two Leslie's Instagram posts quoted a critic who seemed to say Riseboro was better than Kate Blanchett. You're not supposed to single out the competition. And that's what the Academy seemed to say yesterday. In a statement, CEO Bill Kramer said, while it was concerned about some of two Leslie's campaign tactics, none of them rose to the level where nominations have to be rescinded. They say they will clarify the rules next year. As for this year, Riseboro still has the backing of huge celebrities and her performance is not flying under the radar anymore. There's also the issue of who gets snubbed in all this, right? Somebody doesn't get a nomination. Viola Davis was expected to be nominated. She wasn't. That's part of the backlash here. More on all these stories at abcnews.com or the ABC News app. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. So much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby! It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. I'm innocent. I am innocent. I am innocent. How annoying that you just said all this innocent stuff for so long and you're really guilty. She would throw things. <laughs> it was like working with a 40-year-old child. The Housewife Scam.